All right. Uh, welcome to the second day of the class. Um, I, uh, I, I really need to figure out how to reset my sound settings. I don't know why turning my volume all the way down is almost working. Just give me one second to see if I can find uh, an, you know, I, I turn my, it says I'm muted. So it says I'm muted on the computer. You know what, let me do, I will just, uh, I will just turn this thing off and put it far away from myself until I need it. All right. You can see the effect of growing up on a farm sometimes when I don't know how to use everyday devices. All right. Uh, now you now you know my my origin of my handicaps. Okay. I hope that uh, everyone got a chance to um, uh, go and and look at the syllabus and look at some of the materials. Uh, hopefully everyone has downloaded the book and noticed that it is free online and this is not a bootleg copy. The author actually has an agreement that allows him to post this book free online. Uh, can I get one little confirmation that someone hears me and I'm not just talking to the ether here? We, we can hear you. Some thumbs up or something? Uh, no? We can hear All you. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, I will assume that those uh, those thumbs are representative of all of you. Of course, I would need to do a, a careful statistical procedure to do that, and you'll know how to do these things later in the class. Uh, all right, so um, I think I have created another problem, and that is that I shared the wrong screen. All right. Okay, so uh, we are going back to what we started doing last week. Can you guys hear the echo or is it just on my end? Somebody, somebody tell me uh, whether you hear an echo. Thumbs up if you do hear an echo. There's no echo. Okay. So I'm, I'm perpetually in search of ways to fix this problem. I'm going to just take just one moment. Uh, I'm glad that you guys don't hear it, but I hear it loud and clear. It's quite disturbing. Uh, all right. I'm going to um, I'm going to turn down my volume, and uh, and you might have to chat to alert me because I'm really going down to minimal volume here. Uh, so that I just don't don't hear myself talking with a little time delay. All right. So hopefully this is better. Okay. So what did we? Where did we end last? Through the syllabus, some of the course uh, format, um, and uh, we got start started with a little bit of lecture material. I posted some announcements. Uh, they have to do with you know just alerting you that a quiz is coming next Thursday. Obviously that will only cover very basic things that we're talking about uh, this week and on next Tuesday. Um, but those are important foundations. Do get started reading. Um, you know, don't fall behind at the beginning of the class because this class really builds every single thing that we're going to learn builds on the thing before. And uh, so you don't want to fall behind at any point. Um, what, el what else can I say? The, um, uh, the book is free online. The solutions manual, the student solutions manual is not free online. Uh, but you can buy a copy of that for, I think I paid $21 for mine. Um, you know, I really recommend that you guys go out and get this. I have uh, had a chance to uh, look through some of the examples. There are some very nice problems in there and the solutions are written out in great detail. And, uh, and I will be posting recommended problems out of the student solutions manual um, over the course of the, of the, the course and I haven't posted any of those this week, but I will get those up today. And, uh, and I think it can be a great study guide. Okay, so we don't have any official homework, but it, uh, it, it, it is incumbent upon you to stay with the course. And I think just doing the worksheets might not leave you fully prepared for, for the quiz days. Okay, so the worksheets you can think of as your graded homework assignments, but the, uh, to, to really get a complete view of all the, all the possible concepts that show up, you want to walk through those suggested problems. Uh, 
I want to point out, and I already did in the announcements, that I will occasionally suggest problems from the solutions manual that are quite difficult. And I don't want those to scare you. Um, I will not give you quiz questions that are uh, you know, extremely, the, the quiz questions will be comparable to the level of difficulty that you will encounter in the worksheets. But some of those suggested problems are really difficult. Uh, they are also really enlightening. And I hope that you guys will uh, you know, bravely uh, trudge through them with the solutions manual at your side. I think you'll learn a lot from doing that. Um, it is largely the way I learned the subject. I have notebooks on this shelf that are full of my, uh, my pencil uh, writing, just going through textbooks and doing the example problems. Uh, you know, call me old fashioned, but I think it's a great way to learn anything in the realm of mathematics. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to now uh, shift gears and start talk. Oh, one last note that I put in my announcement. My office hours were empty yesterday. So, you know, every time that my office hours are empty, it means that some of you who uh, self-professed to have deficiencies in your math preparation uh, have missed an opportunity to come and and uh, get help. Okay, so I, you know, will will stay for the whole hour. I will give you all the help that you need during the hour. And I think that you'll find that if you're there and you're asking questions, and the hour ends, uh, I usually am happy to stay longer. Uh, but you know, you guys have to come and you have to log on. I know that the Zoom format is not exactly, it, you know, not exactly conducive to the most engaging uh, interactions with the professor but I will do my best, uh, but people have to come. All right, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's pick up <clears throat> where we left off. We were talking about Venn diagrams and some basic concepts out of set theory. We're gonna continue to do a little bit of that today and hopefully get into some uh, real examples and some actual axioms of probability. But first, let me just start here. Um, this is a... Um, this is a, a little overview of a few tools that we will use all the time in our discussion of, of probability, okay? So it's often useful to remember that you can decompose, okay? This is the terminology I will use. You can decompose a set A into its intersections with another set B and its complement BC, okay? So the way that works is that you take A and you write it as the union of A and B plus the union of A and not B, okay? Now I have, that's the exact same set that I started with. Uh, you see that everything, in, everything that belongs to this set has to be a member of A, but I've just sort of divided it according to where the boundary of B is. Very useful thing as we will see soon. Uh, and here's a little Venn diagram portrayal of that concept right here. Uh, so you have your sets A and B and you take the part that overlaps with B and you add it to the part that does not overlap with B and you get the whole set A back, okay? This is a really useful decomposition. Uh, I have written here a plus sign. Really that corresponds to a union, okay? Uh, we will often, and your book does this a lot, uses plus and minus, okay? So if a plus corresponds to a union, you might guess that there might be a simple uh, operation in set theory that corresponds to subtraction as well. Uh, it is simple, but it's maybe not quite as intuitive as the plus, and it has some weird properties, okay? So if I define addition as a union of A and B, uh, that's, that's this relation right here, um, then I can also think about defining a subtraction of B from A as taking A in its intersection with everything that's not in B, okay? So it's important to note that this does not work the way normal subtraction does, okay? I will often, you'll find, go ahead and write A intersection, not B, because I think that this subtraction idea for set theory is a little bit strange, has some counterintuitive properties. Here's one example, okay? If I take A minus B and then I add B back, I don't always get A back, okay? And, and you can see why this is by drawing out the Venn diagrams. Okay, so if I take two sets, just like the ones that I've always been working with here, and I consider these two cases. In one case, B lives inside A. That's this one down here. This, this little symbol means that B is contained in set A. 
Okay, in that case, if I take A and I subtract away the part that overlaps with B, I get this little, little you know, distorted donut ring depicted here on the left. And then I add B back, I get back to the original set A. But if I do the normal way that we have been drawing these where A and B, neither of them completely contains the other, then I take A, I subtract away the part that overlaps with B and I get this little, little crescent moon kind of shape on the left. Now I add back B and I get something bigger than what I started with, okay? So this is an important point that we write plus and minus in set theory, but they don't obey the same additive inverse rules that you learned in your first grade math class, okay? So it's just a useful thing to keep in mind. Okay, and then we, you know, in the lecture last time, it, I should maybe pause for questions once in a while because, um, because it's easy to get. You and that you can hear me. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll try and keep the chat open so that I spot them uh, as I'm going. <clears throat> all right. Uh, last time we went through and we did this little uh, cute, cute demonstration that uh, you can, you know, take sentences and analyze them with set theory and sometimes find that the way we speak and practice is not really very logical. Uh, but, um, but you know, everybody knows what Louis Armstrong meant. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead now and begin to talk about the axioms of probability. This is going, you know, I mentioned yesterday that this is a really wonderful subject because you start from things that seem so patently obvious that they don't even need to be said. And you can build from these three things, the entire subject of probability, and from that, the entire subject of statistics. And this was uh, much of the work uh, that Kolmogorov did. Uh, and, and I, you know, we won't, we won't see even a third of what, what he did in this subject, but, um, you know, if you join my lab and work in my group as an undergraduate researcher, you might see a lot of Kolmogorov. We, we do a lot of things that build upon his, uh, his work on stochastic processes. But anyway, that's, a, that's for the, uh, the 17th week of this class. Uh, okay, let's begin with these axioms. For any event A, the probability of that event must be greater than or equal to zero, okay? Can't tell you how many times I've graded exams and asked for the probability of some event and had a student give me an answer that was negative, okay? It's not possible. It doesn't have any meaning. The probability can be zero, but it can never be less than zero, okay? It always has to be a positive number or, or zero. Uh, if S represents the entire sample space, then the probability of something in that sample, of getting something in that sample space has to be identically equal to one, okay? And then the last one, so these two are the completely obvious. There's no, no need to really uh, even think about these. Uh, the, the third one is maybe a little bit less obvious, but still not, not so surprising. If I have A1, A2, A3, et cetera, I can define as many of these as I want. And as long as in the Venn diagram, these things have no overlap, that is to say that they are mutually exclusive, then the probability of their union is the sum of their probabilities, okay? So you can really just picture that on the, on the, the Venn diagram. You know, feel free to type in the chat and say, I, I want an example, um, but you can imagine with, with dice, there are easy examples you can construct. When you roll it, you're gonna get a number one through six. And if you wanna know the probability of getting a one or three, those things are two mutually exclusive outcomes, and I can add the probability of getting a one to the probability of getting a three, and I, I have one sixth plus one sixth gives me one third. Uh, I don't have to worry about any cross, cross terms in here because though they were mutually exclusive events, and that's what this third axiom says. Okay, uh, now let's go back and think about something that we just learned in the context of these axioms. And let, me, let me continue to show the axioms up here. Okay, so when we talked about a decomposition of A into its overlap with B and B complement, we saw that we could write the event A as this, this big thing that's inside here. So this is really just another way of writing A according to our set theory decomposition of set A, okay? 
And by construction, that decomposition creates two mutually exclusive uh, parts of A, the part that overlaps with B and the part that does not. And you can't, you can't be on the fence, okay? You either overlap or you don't. Uh, all right, so, so what does that mean? That means that I can always write the probability of an event A as the probability that I have A and B added to the probability that I have event A and not B, okay? And this again will be something that will be very useful as we begin to talk about Bayes' theorem and things like that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on and talk about the inclusion exclusion principle. For any two events, A and B, uh, the probability that the probability of A union B is going to be the probability of independent event A plus the probability of event B minus the probability of their overlap, the probability of their intersection to be, uh, to be uh, precise. Okay, we can go through and we can, we can prove this. We aren't gonna do a lot of proofs in this class. So don't, don't panic if you've not, uh, you know, ever honed those skills of, of, uh, of proving things. Uh, most of the things that we're gonna, we're gonna prove in this class are they're probably three or four and uh, they're not very difficult. Okay, so we know that event A and event B intersection with A complement, those are gonna be mutually exclusive events. Okay, so we can, we can write down that A union B intersection A complement is the same as A union B. Okay, so you can, you can see that uh, if you go in here, you have event A and in red, you have the event B intersection A complement. Okay. So that is the entire event A union B. Okay. Uh, if I add those two together and they are by construction, mutually exclusive events. Okay. So now we're going to use this axiom number three and write down that the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of the same set, but rewritten in terms of its overlap with, with B and A complement. So we have A union B intersection A complement. And these are this is a union now of two mutually exclusive sets inside the argument of P. And that can now be broken into the probability of A plus the probability of B intersection A complement, specifically the black part and the red part. Okay, we can add those two probabilities together separately. Now we know that I can also write down the probability of a set B as a sum. So I can write down this is a sum of this thing and this thing. And so when I encounter, when I encounter this guy in my equation, I can write it as PB minus PA intersection B. All we're doing is using the thing that we just proved above. Okay, we're using this. All right, and that's the formula. That's the thing that we set out to prove. So we have probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. Now, I, I you know, remember when I was learning this stuff, I thought, oh man, the picture is a proof itself. And I think that you will probably get away with that for the most part, if you wanna think about it that way. You draw the Venn diagrams and think about what you've counted and what you haven't. It's actually a pretty safe way of constructing these proofs. Um, you know, the mathematicians like to see like to see this done all formally. And so I've done it the way they would like, uh, but the Venn diagram is, is pretty reliable. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, let's do an example. So you're gonna roll two dice and you're gonna obtain for the first roll X1, number between one and six. Uh, for the second one, you're gonna obtain X2. And what you're supposed to do now is to find the probability that you obtain at least one six. Okay, so it always helps to think about what the sample space is. It's a list of six by six discrete outcomes. That's 36 possible outcomes. They are all the pairs. I, it would be a big table and forgive me for not writing it. Uh, I can now go in and, and list what are the events that belong to this set of interest A. I, I gave it a name A here without saying. So that corresponds to X1 equals six. Oops, I'm erasing stuff x1 equals 6, x2 equals 1 is one outcome. I can do x1 equals 6 with x2 equals 2. And I can continue going until I get both 6s. Remember, it was at least one 6. Very important in these problems that you read the question very carefully and do it, do it literally. 
uh, I can also have x1 come out to be not a six, but the second, second die gives me a six. And those outcomes are all here. Notice that I don't count the last one twice. That's the same outcome as the one I already listed. And so 11 of the possible outcomes, 11 of the 36 outcomes to be specifically, uh, are, are uh, belong to my requirement, my set A. And so the probability of that event now is gonna be 11 over 36. The implicit assumption that we're probably all comfortable with making is that each of these outcomes is equally likely. And which is basically another way to say that is that the dice were fair. We don't have any weighted die in our casino. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and, you know, I have to figure out how to, how to undo all of these uh, little chicken scratches here that I've made. Oh my gosh, so many. All right, maybe I should figure out a better way to undo these. Um, I think that's probably gonna have to cover it. Okay, um, all right, let's go ahead now and talk about another concept. We're uh, making, making fast progress today. You guys have to type in questions if you want me to slow down. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, uh, fully willing to stop and, and take questions, uh, but you know, in the, the absence of any questions, I'll assume you guys all think that this stuff is pretty basic and obvious and ready to go on. Uh, all right, conditional probability. This is section 1.4 in the Pichro Nick book. Um, so we define a probability of an event A uh, given an event B as the probability that A and B happen divided by the probability that event B happens. And we can really think about what, what this formula is doing. We have taken the original sample space S, which was, which was big compared to A and B, and we have restricted our consideration of events to those which already fall inside of B. Okay, so that does two things. One, it cuts off part of A, and two, it makes the denominator by which we normalize probabilities smaller. Okay, and that's what is accounted for. The red term upstairs in this formula tells you how much of A overlaps with state B, the given, the given thing that must happen. And the, the green part in the basement tells you uh, how much smaller the normalization factor has to be to account for the fact that we're no longer considering the whole sample space, only those things in state B. All right, hopefully that gives you some intuition about how this formula looks and why it, why it, uh, why it looks this way. Uh, all right, so conditional probabilities are proper probabilities. They, uh, they are things that we use all the time. And sometimes if everything, it depends on a condition, we even can forget to write the condition, right? So. I will work a problem later that talks about uh, high school football players. And it's, um, you know, almost 100% almost of high school football players are boys. And so the entire problem could, you could write down in every step of the entire problem that we're conditioning things on, uh, on being male. Uh, but you could also leave it out because if we, if we only uh, talked about um, you know, if all the things have the same conditions, then it, then it almost is like we're, we're not even working with a, a condition distribution anymore. So let me try and show you that principle in, in writing. So this is, this is what I mean by that, is that conditional probabilities also obey the three axioms. That is to say that if I talk about an event, a probability of an event A, condition given an event B, that also has to be greater than or equal to zero. If I talk about an event B and I consider the entire sample space given that I'm restricted to B, which is really to say the probability of B given B, that has to be one. And if I talk about the probability of events A, one, A2, dot, 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 all condition, all, all given that event B happened, I can write that, I can decompose that into a sum of probabilities of A1 given B, plus probability of A2 given B plus dot, dot, dot. And I can do this as long as A1 intersection B, A2 intersection B, et cetera, if all of these sets are mutually exclusive. There, there's technically a little mistake in your book right here. He tells you that you have to have A1, A2, A3, all those be mutually exclusive. That's not necessarily required. You have to have the A1 intersection B 
A2, intersection B, those things have to be mutually exclusive. It's a easier requirement to satisfy in a sense, okay? Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and, and talk about an example. Um, Huff, Huffington Post says that high school football is dangerous because about 15 high school football deaths occur per 100,000 high school football players each year. This is from a real news story. Is it fair to call high school football dangerous? Okay, so statistics has it, statistics bears on everything. Uh, every every quantitative claim that you hear in daily life uh, has uh, in almost every case it has some connection to statistics. Okay, so we're going to go through and do this. So what the Huff Post article is saying is that the probability of dying, given that you play high school football, we could also write given that you are male, if you want. Um, because it, it almost doesn't change the set that we're talking about. There may be a few exceptions here and there, uh, but probability of, of dying given that you play high school football is 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. And uh, so that is death given high school football. And my, my notation here is effectively defined. Death corresponds to event D and high school football corresponds to event F, all right? So, so, you know, I, I tried to fill in the details and ask what would make this a fair statement? Uh, well, we need to know what is the probability of death given that you don't play high school football uh, so that we can compare apples and shoes here. So it's, it's an unfortunate thing that many people think I can make a claim and the number sounds, sounds too big. And of course it is too big if you're the parent of one of those students. Um, but, uh, but what is the number that we should compare it to? You know, numbers are never big unless we compare them to something else. Uh, all right, so according to the CDC, uh, about 80 males per 100,000 males in the category from 15 years of age to 18 years of age die each year. That means that the probability of death, uh, just given that you are male and in high school age, is eight times 10 to the minus four. So already you can see here a indication that high school football might be less dangerous than some of the other things that teenagers do. Uh, what fraction of boys play high school football? I, I couldn't really find that number, but I can make an estimate. So this is something that as engineers, I hope you guys appreciate that, you know, you have to estimate things all the time. We're constantly asked to work with incomplete and imperfect data. So we have 1.3 million uh, people in high school football each year. That is actually from the web. I looked, I looked that up, can't remember the website. Now, how many boys are in high school each year? Remember, everything was based on this per 100,000 basis. So the number of boys in high school each year, uh, I don't know, that's a hard thing to estimate, but we can, we can do it. We can say, well, the US population has been 300 million people for a long time. And let's assume that it's, it's basically steady state. So we have 300 million people is our steady population. Half of them are boys, one in 70, one, so the, the number per age uh, is one over 75, that's based on a 75 year lifespan. And the number of years that each person spends in high school is four. Uh, I, I am not distinguishing people who finish high school from those who don't. Uh, okay, and so that ends up giving you that there are approximately 10 million boys in high school at, at any given year, okay? And so we, we have now computed that about 1.3 million per 10 million uh, equals 13% of high school boys are playing high school football. And that gives me the probability of event F is 0.13. So remember the whole point of this exercise was to say that the Huffington Post story here is incomplete without this comparison number. We want the probability of dying given that you don't play high school football. And you know, the premise here, the way I think about this is that you know, teenagers that aren't supervised by a coach might not break their arm, but they might go out and race their car, or they might drink, or they might do drugs, or they might do something else dangerous. And, uh, and so really we have to inform ourselves um, you know, what, uh, what the real comparison is. And you can go through and you can do the analysis using these conditional probability rules. So we want the probability of death, given that you don't play high school football, I'm right here in the, in the calculation, and that can be written using our definition of conditional probability as the probability of death intersection with not playing football divided by the probability of not playing football. And I can now decompose the numerator into this expression. 
death minus the probability of death and playing football. Uh, I keep the denominator the way it is because I know what that's going to be. It's one minus this quantity. Okay, the probability of not playing football is 0.87. Uh, and now I, now I go ahead and I just fill in numbers. Okay, so these are all the numbers. If you want to follow through, uh, this was our probability of death from the CDC. Uh, this was the, um, uh, the probability of death given that you played football, probability that you played football, and the probability that you didn't play football in the denominator. And you see how we reduced this problem to something that wasn't given, and we turned it into things that were given information or that we could look up or we could estimate. Okay, and the answer comes out to be uh, 10 to the minus three. Okay, so 10 to the minus three is larger than the seemingly scary number 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. In fact, it's about seven times larger. I don't know, I wouldn't, wouldn't stand by that without a more careful analysis, uh, but you know, it's probably uh, reasonably close to the right number. And it suggests that the story really is incomplete. Yes, nobody wants their kid to come home with broken ankles and stuff. Uh, but if we measure uh, risk of this game by death uh, and we use the, the available data, it, it turns out that the claim that it's dangerous really isn't supported. Uh, okay, so um, let's go on and talk about independence. Events that have no bearing on each other are independent. Mathematically, we say that A and B are independent if and only if, and you'll often see that I will write this phrase if and only if with IFF uh, instead of the regular single if. Uh, and, and the way we write down that they're independent is by requiring that we have the probability of A intersection B is the product of the two probabilities, okay? So we saw that unions end up giving us for mutually exclusive events a sum of two probabilities. Intersections for independent events give us a product of two probabilities. Now, who can tell me are independent events mutually exclusive? Somebody type into the chat, some brave person type into the chat. Yes, are they mutually exclusive? Well, what does it mean if I say that two events are independent? We say that one, one event has no bearing on the other. So if I think that I have two events that are mutually exclusive and I know that event A happened, then I'm gonna be able to guarantee that event B didn't happen. And by definition, that means that event A has, tells me something about event B. So in fact, Events that are, that are mutually exclusive are never independent. Always learn something about, about, uh, about one event from the other if those, those events are exclusive. Okay, so it's a you know, bit, of, bit of a trick question perhaps, but, uh, but it shows that you know, this stuff really requires a, a honing of your intuition and careful thinking about, uh, about how things work. Okay, so remember, that if we had probability of A intersection, or sorry, probability of A union B, uh, and A and B were independent, we saw that PA plus PB can be added to estimate this, okay? I'll, I'll put a little asterisk here because this is only true if they're mutually exclusive. And this is only true if A and B are independent. And if this is true, then I know A and B are independent. So the arrow goes both ways here. Okay, uh, we can also say some things about, uh, about uh, conditional probabilities based on independent events. Uh, if A and B are independent, then I know that the probability of A is the same as the probability of A. It doesn't tell me anything more to tell me what happened to B, whether B happened or not. Remember, it means that A and B have no bearing on each other. So telling me, well, B happened, what do you know about A now? Same as what I knew about A before. Okay, so P, Probability of A given B, you can prove this, the probability of A given B is the probability of A in intersection B uh, over the probability of B. I know I can write that probability of A intersection B if these things are independent as a product. And of course the PB factors just cancel and we're left with the probability of A. All right, so uh, we are, we are uh, making some progress here and I'm gonna go ahead now and talk about uh, talk about another example. So I have to be careful and watch the time. I wanna make sure I save uh, some time for Zichu to do, uh, to, to do a worksheet today. Uh, all right, so this example is from your book again. Uh, let's suppose that we know the following events. Uh, we know the following events A, B, and C have these properties. 
Uh, A and C are independent. B and C are independent. A and B are mutually exclusive. And A union C has probability two thirds. B union C has probability three fourths. And A union B union C has probability 11 over two. Notice that the one that includes all three has to be bigger than the one that only included two of the three. Okay, that's a, that's a consequence of our inclusion exclusion principle, okay? Or you can think of it as a consequence of that third, that third axiom in, in uh, Kolmogorov's work. All right, so the, the question that we're asked to do is to find P of A, P of B, and P of C. All right, and, and really, you can think of this the same way you always do. These are three equations and you have three unknowns. We're gonna call them little a, little b, and little c, just to keep the notation simple. Uh, but these correspond to probability of a, probability of b, probability of c, uh, respectively. All right, so what do the given equations say? Well, it, it always helps to draw a Venn diagram and try and make it consistent with the things that you're given, okay? So here are the events A, B, and C. And what do I know? I know that A and C are independent. I know that C and B are independent. That's a hard thing to draw. Independence is a, is a difficult thing to draw. It can take many different forms. Uh, but mutually exclusive is not a hard thing to draw. I know that if I'm told that these things are mutually exclusive, A and B cannot overlap with each other. They could overlap with C, and, and uh, you know, both of them can overlap with C, but they cannot overlap each other, right? And that's the key feature that has to be present in this diagram. So now I can go ahead and I can translate these statements about the probabilities of these events using our axioms and definitions of, of independence and, and conditionals. Uh, I can use them to write down the, the three equations in terms of the three unknowns. So the probability of event A union C, I can look at my diagram and I can say, well, that's gonna be the probability of A plus the probability of C uh, minus the overlap region right here in between them. And that has to come out to be two thirds. Okay, now I have an equation that relates A to C. I can do the same thing with probabilities of, of B union C. That has to be B plus C minus the overlap. And because events A events B and C are independent, I know that to compute that overlap probability, I just have to multiply A and, A and C and B and C, right? You see where I got this, right? This comes from the fact that these were independent, okay? We know that A and C were independent, and so I can just multiply them. B and C were independent, I can just multiply them, all right? Uh, now for the third one, I have A union B union C. We have to be a little bit more careful of this time. Uh, I'm going to start out the same way, inclusion, exclusion. I have A plus B plus C. I want to subtract the overlaps that I've double counted. So A overlaps with C, and it overlaps by an amount given by its independence. So I have A times C minus the overlap with B and C, and that's a, a factor of BC. I don't have a factor of A and B in here. Why not? Uh, would that be because A and B are independent of one another? Good. Uh, not because they're independent. Because they're it's not because they're independent. A and B are what? Mutually exclusive. Disjoint. Okay, good. You're using this notation, this terminology disjoint. That is perfectly fine. Uh, but you will hear me mostly call them mutually exclusive. Uh, all right, so, so good. So uh, disjoint, mutually exclusive. Either way, it means they don't have any overlap and we can't be in both sets at the same time, okay? So that, that is complete now without the AB term and we get 11 over 12. Uh, so this is three equations, three unknowns and I won't go through the algebra to solve these but you get that A is one third, B is one half and C is one half, okay? Uh, all right, so uh, by the way, I have, a, I have a, a graduate student who is working with clues from experimental data on grafting of a catalyst to amorphous silica to try and understand the populations of different, different uh, silanol types in categories A, B, and C, basically, and using these clues to write down equations that look almost exactly like this. 
and then solve them. And uh, you know, it, it turns out when you know these things, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been done that is very doable. And so, you know, realistic chemical engineering applications of probability uh, everywhere. All right, so how much time do we have left? Um, uh, I think I might have some time uh, to just introduce uh, Bayes' rule. Uh, let me go ahead and do that, and then we'll be ready to do some worksheets about Bayes' rule on next Tuesday. Okay, suppose that you know the probability of A you really want is the probability of B given A. Okay, so you can exploit this thing called Bayes' rule. So the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B is the probability of A intersection with B. And I, it doesn't matter which order I write things here. So I can also decompose that intersection into a probability of B given A multiplied by a probability of A. Okay, and that means that this thing and this thing are equal to each other. And now we can go through and we can solve for the P of B given A and relate that to P of A given B. So probability of B given A is the probability of A given B uh, multiplied by the probability of B divided by the probability of A. All right, so this is Bayes' rule as it's commonly known. And there are two versions of this. I'll call this number one. Um, the, the other one is often known as Bayes' theorem uh, or just the second Bayes' rule. And so it, where that second one comes into play is that in the situations where you want to do this, where you want to, we want this, but what you know are quantities like that, it's often the case that you want to find this and you also don't know this, okay? Uh, and I think you just have to work through some examples to see why that tends to happen. Uh, but they just tend to be closely related situations that when I want this, I often, and I don't have it, I often also don't have this. All right, so what can we do? Well, we're gonna decompose that denominator uh, and, and uh, we can do that with any other set that we want. The natural one, if I have, I want to write P, sub, P of A is to decompose it with, with its overlaps with B and B complement. Okay, so this is how you do it. We have P of A can be written as P of A given B uh, multiplied by P of B plus P of A given not B multiplied by P of not B. And uh, these two things, of course, you may remember from just a moment ago, are really just A intersection B and A intersection not B. Okay, so you can, you can write these lots of different ways, but this is the most convenient one, because remember the point was that we have some data on quantities like this, and now you see we have written a denominator in terms of things that we have. Okay, I don't have P of A, but I might have P of B and I have B of B complement and I have these reversed conditional probabilities. And now I can get the one that I wanted in terms of things that I have available. Okay, so this is an extremely useful, extremely useful little principle. Um, it has applications all over the place. You know, when you hear people on the news talking about how effective is this vaccine, that really comes down to a very careful analysis of these terms and you know, it depends in a, in a very sensitive way to false positive rates and to uh, false negative rates and the prevalence of the disease in the population. Uh, very difficult thing to test accurately uh, when the disease is not, is not very prevalent. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and do, um, let, me, let me go ahead and, and do a very simple example that I think will drive that point home. 1% uh, of people in Champaign County have COVID-19. Uh, the UIUC saliva test has a 0.3% false positive rate. These are the real numbers. And it has an 11% false negative rate. What that means is that if you, uh, if you don't have the disease and you go get a saliva test, there's a 0.3% chance that it will tell you that you, you have tested positive, and which really would ruin your day. You have to go quarantine and you didn't have the disease. Uh, there's also a possibility of the disease there's an 11% chance that it will not detect that you have it. And uh, that ruins your roommate's day. Uh, okay, so if you get a positive test, what is the probability that you actually have COVID-19? So let's define some events. We have plus is the event that you've tested positive, And we have I is the event that you are actually infected. So what does the problem statement say? 
it says that the, the prevalence of infection, that probability that a given person is actually infected is 1%. That's, that's the, uh, you know, that's a difficult thing to estimate in itself, but we're gonna take the estimates that are available now. Okay. Uh, we also are given that the probability that you will test positive, given that you aren't infected, that's your false positive rate, that's 0 0.003. The probability that you will test negative, given that you actually are infected, is that 11% false negative rate. Uh, and what we want is the answer to this question the probability that you're infected given that you've tested positive, okay? So this is an important first step in doing these problems every time. Write down the available information in the problem, define events, and write all the available information in terms of probabilities that you're given. And the second step is to make the very easy identification of other things that you know based on what was given, okay? So immediately from the probability of infected, uh, probability that a given person is infected, no testing information available, you can immediately infer that the probability that a person is not infected is, is one minus that, is 99%. You can immediately infer that the probability of, uh, so the probability of being uh, testing positive given that you're not infected uh, is 0 0.003, therefore the probability of testing negative given that you're not infected is 0.997 and the probability of uh, testing negative given that you are infected is, is 0.11 tells you that the probability of testing positive given that you were infected is 0.89, okay? You guys see how these things, they just follow immediately from the given information. So I would, I would sort of set it up as two, as two stages, define your events and write down the given information, uh, write down all the things you can immediately infer from that given information, and then apply the Bayes rule framework and let's answer the question. So we have P of I given positive. So this is infected given that you tested positive. Uh, I'm gonna use Bayes rule here, Bayes rule number one first. P of, of plus given I times P of I over P plus. I don't know P plus. I have no way of directly estimating that other than to decompose that event into other events that I know. So I'm gonna decompose P plus into this big denominator term. And that is P plus given I times PI plus P plus given I complement multiplied by P of I complement. Now, every single thing in this formula down here, they are all things that I know. And I can you know, plug in the numbers that I was given above and I find that I have a 75% chance given that, uh, given that uh, uh, Robert, uh, Robert Mc, uh, what is his name? The guy who gives you the test results back? I don't remember. I have a lot of emails from him. Uh, okay, there's a doctor named Robert who sends us Robert McKinley. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's right. I think McKinley might be the testing center. Um, uh, I don't go get tested as often as I should. I, I don't, I'm allowed to go to work anyway. Um, okay, so uh, so the probability that you actually have COVID is, is 0.75. So there's a chance if you get a positive test uh, that you may have just been one of those unfortunate people who got a false negative. Now, why is it, why is it, you know, that you have this test that's 99 reliable uh, at, um, at detecting an infection is, um, that is uh, pretty decent at not giving you false negatives. And yet you have this low uh, uh, probability of being infected given that you tested positive. Well, it has to do with the relative sizes of this false positive rate and the prevalence of the infection. When these two things are comparably small, then even a very reliable test can, can be uh, unreliable in practice, okay? So, and that's something that you can understand through uh, Bayes' theorem. I'm gonna stop here and let uh, the last 25 minutes uh, be for uh, a worksheet that Zichu has prepared. And so uh, Zichu, I'm gonna hand it over to you and uh, you can uh, introduce the worksheet and just uh, send people to the Prairie Learn site and, and I'll be here to help answer questions. Okay, so I, I just need to ask this question. Um, are we also doing the pharmaceutical question today? I am so sorry. I've got my volume turned down so low. I can barely hear you. Can you please start over again? 
sorry, so the pharmaceutical question, if you remember about the in impurity one. How are we For doing? some reason, my, I'm still having some audio audio difficulties. Uh, here, let me let me just uh, completely log out of my my Zoom and uh, on this thing. Okay, I am. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, for the okay. students. All right, I should have everything back to normal now. Um, oh, okay. All right. Uh, what was that, Zichu? So, are we doing the pharmaceutical question as well today? Zichu? Can you hear me? Uh, uh oh. Um. Uh, can students hear me? We can hear you. Um. Okay. So maybe just um go to the Prairie Learn website and um open the worksheet one, and uh we can start working on that. I, I do not know what's going wrong. Zichu, are you are you there? She is talking. Um, she's talking just now. Okay, what, what is going on with my sound? I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, this is the problem. Okay, I'm so sorry. That's my fault. Zichu, I, I was not wearing my headphones. I'm sorry. I do not know why. Can you guys hear me? Yes. You do. Oh, I just heard you loud and clear. Oh, uh, I have no idea. I I just told the students to work on the okay worksheet one that I okay. Are the uh, are the the questions in there? Do we need to show them the uh, the question while while it's going? What What do you mean? Oh, it, you can open it and see. Great, it. great. Thank you so much. Is it you? I might I might ask you for some help. Um, help with the worksheet or uh, yeah, I'm I'm just I'm I'm wondering do the students know where they're supposed to be? I, I am having trouble myself, so okay, I'll put the link in the chat. You know what I'm having trouble with is navigating the Prairie Learn menu. Um, I, I, 
maybe because it's extra complicated as an instructor compared to what the students see, but. Um, So if you go to the Prairie Learn homepage and open the course, I think you will see the worksheet. Okay. Okay, I have just shared my screen and here's what I here's what I see here. And I'm I think I maybe because I'm in course admin. Okay, just click on the left corner, the top left. left. Go to home page. Okay. Go to home page top left. Okay. And yeah, down here click the spring 2020. Yeah, that one. Ah, so I'm not supposed to click that one that says courses. I'm supposed to go to course instances. Okay, thank yes. you. All right. Uh, worksheet one, finding probabilities. That's where they are. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay, so so the uh, the the plan was to go through and and uh, walk them through these things, uh, and and I needed a walk through to to find the right Prairie Learn sheet. I'm I'm sorry for that. That shows how how helpful Zichu is. That I really don't even know how to navigate the Prairie Learn system without her help. So she has she has made this uh, this worksheet. Uh, on our own. Um, let me um, let me try to just say a little bit. You guys are probably already halfway done with this thing while I was figuring out how to get in. Uh, the probability that it will rain today or tomorrow. Uh, remember, the first step is to define your events. Uh, so you have three different, uh, you have today and tomorrow and you have rain. Um, and so you really have to define at least two events depending on how you do this. So for those of you who haven't, haven't already done it, um, I would define the event A as rain today and the event uh, B as rain tomorrow. Okay. And uh, let, well, let's see that they already, oh, so he says exactly the same thing. He says correctly invert, uh, convert these things into probability language and he defines A and B the same way that I just suggested. Okay, so you see how how much on the same page I am with this author's author's book. It, it almost as though uh, almost as though uh, it's the same person. Um, it's not. He's a different person. Uh, okay, so P A you are given is zero point six, and P B is zero point five. And you are also given an extra piece of information that has to do with both of them. And that is that the probability of A complement intersection B complement, which is does not rain on either day is 0 0.3. Okay. Uh, and you are, you are to find the probability that it will rain today or tomorrow. So you're looking for the probability of A union B Okay, in part A. How do we get it? So, so who wants to tell us what, uh, what would be a useful thing that we've learned that might help us get there? So the probability that it will rain, uh, rain today or tomorrow is one minus the probability that it will not rain on either of the two days, uh, which is just a one minus the uh, complement of the event in question. You can always do this. Uh, then 
then you then he has this clever suggestion to use De Morgan's law. So remember when you see A union B complement, I should get my, uh, I should use my, my notebook again here for this. Um, sorry, I, I, this is, this is uh, not gone as well as I hoped. I, um, I, have, I have lost my iPad. <laughs> okay, uh, back on track here. Um, all right, we can, Zichu, if it's possible, maybe we can give them some extra time to uh, correct for my, my snafus here. Uh, all right, so let me go ahead and, and open this thing and, um, and rejoin the, the same meeting here. Uh, I really wish I had bought a touchscreen laptop because I can't do this stuff on my iPad. I can only do this stuff on my iPad now. And that's why I have to be logged into both. Eight nine eight oh four two five. All right, so I am now sharing my whiteboard. And uh, I think that's probably okay if you guys don't see my uh, navigation difficulties anymore. Uh, all right, so we have uh, P of A was equal to 0 0.6, P of B was equal to 0 0.5, and we were given also that P of A complement intersection B complement was equal to 0 0.3. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, well, what does the question ask? It asks for P of A union B, uh, we can always write that as one minus P of uh, the opposite of A union B, which is A union B complement. Uh, we are suggested, I'm getting some stray marks in here uh, from my uh, whiteboard pen, uh, but this is going to be, um, this is going to be one minus the probability of, uh, if I use De Morgan's laws, to translate this thing into something else, I will get this is the probability of A complement intersection with B complement. Okay, so that's our that's our uh, next step here. And A complement intersection B complement is something that we were given, right? So that's this point three. So this is one minus uh, zero point three. I'm trying my best. My pen died, 0 0.3. And so the answer to part A should be 0 0.7, okay? Uh, so if we were to go through now and do uh, part B, the probability that it will rain today and tomorrow, P of A and B, uh, how, can we, how can we get that one? Well, here we're talking about an intersection uh, we can do this with the exclusion uh, inclusion exclusion principle. We can take uh, we can take p of a and p of b, and uh, and we can. This is actually the, the reverse of this ex inclusion exclusion principle. Let me let me make sure I don't create some confusion about what that says. Uh, so I know that the probability of a union b was equal to p of a plus P of B uh, minus P of A intersection B, okay? This is the one we want, okay? So we can solve for that and, uh, and you get P of A, uh, P of B uh, minus P of union B, A union B, like this. And, uh, and so in the, in the notes, he goes through and he notes that we, we've already found this, right? This thing is something that we now know from part A. And so putting in the numbers of everything else, uh, it, it comes out to be 0.4. Okay, hopefully you guys are, are following along and uh, learning some of the tricks as we go. Not completely obvious, this stuff is already kind of challenging. Uh, so to Nikki Sampath, 
uh, I hope that I hope that this wasn't too late. Um, we are typically going to uh, I will walk through and do the worksheet problems uh, live with you guys, and you guys are uh, hopefully you know really trying to follow them and do them on your own. Uh, but you're going to enter in the the answers as we get them. Okay, it's just a more or less a uh, a engagement activity, low stakes activity, extremely low stakes since you really can't get wrong answers. Um, I hope that that today we didn't have um, people going ahead and trying to answer them on their own, getting wrong answers. If so, I think we can we can go back and correct for that if that's if that's okay with you. Uh, does a complement of an intersection or a union uh, always flip to the other kind? Yes. So De Morgan's laws say that A, and this is really something that has to do with set theory as opposed to something that's innately probability. Uh, but A, intersection B, complement, is going to become A, complement, union, B, complement. And A, union, B, complement, is going to become A complement intersection B complement. Okay, this was this was De Morgan's laws. All right, uh, we are on part C now. Um, to see if I can figure out how to how to put in another page. I, I'm not sure what I just did there. Uh, all right. Uh, part C uh, says we want the probability that it will rain today, but not tomorrow. Okay, uh, so how do we translate that into words? That's the first first thing. So we want the probability that it will rain today, uh, but not tomorrow. And do you think I should put a union or an intersection here? Could be a union. Uh, okay, so if I put a union there, it means that if it rains to today and also rains tomorrow, it would be okay. But I but, think that's not what we mean when we say it's going to rain today, but not tomorrow. They have to both be true, right? So we put an intersection here to require that both of these two outcomes have to have to be satisfied in order to make that whole statement true. Okay, so the event, uh, it's really important that we know we want to practice your skills. Lots of great examples in the book uh, for doing this, uh, but it's an essential first step in all of these problems uh, to translate the language into the quantitative statement. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so so now we. this is what we have to, uh, to find. This is, uh, in Pichro Nick, he would write this as P of A minus B. Okay, remember that subtracting one set from the other is, ah, yes, it's a very good question. So when it says, and you use an intersection, but also we, we tend to use the same, uh, we use a different language for the same kind of statement when we say uh, this and not this, we say this, but not this, and they're the same, right? We, they, there's no difference between the quantitative meaning of those two statements. So you can kind of, you know, get used to, if you hear the word and you're thinking intersections, but also when you hear the word, uh, but like with an exception applied, that's also going to tend to be an intersection, but it's an intersection with a complement of something. Okay. Uh, hopefully that, that helps. So Pichro Nick would, would write this this way. Okay. And, and he does in, in his analysis here. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and, and remember how we can how we can write this thing. So we can write this as the probability of A minus the probability of A intersection with B. Sometimes the best way to see these things is to go ahead and do a Venn diagram. So I have A and B, and I have uh, I have uh, I want A intersection with B complement. Okay, so this is the set that I want. That's wrong. I just did that incorrectly. Is there an undo button here? Uh, there's an eraser. Let me start over again, because I completely messed that up. Okay, 
Here is A and B. Let me try that again. I want A and not B. This is the set that I want right here. Okay. All right. So so now now we see that there are a couple of different ways we might we might write this. But if I want to decompose this into into quantities that I'm given, it would be useful maybe to uh, you know this is useful. I already know the probability of event A. Uh, and and what he is what he has done here is to uh, remove the part that overlaps with B. Okay. So you could really use these Venn diagrams as a guide to working through these problems. Okay. So this is the part that we subtracted from. From, uh, from set A, okay? So we wanna not include this piece and that's why it's subtracted away in the probability. All right, so now from there, uh, we, we actually know uh, this P uh, of A intersection B was the probability that it will rain today and tomorrow. We worked that out in one of the earlier exercises and saw that it was 0.4. And so this is 0.6 from the given information minus 0.4 from things that we've worked out already. And this one ends up being 0.2. Okay, so this next one is, is tough. We want the probability that it will rain today or tomorrow, but not both. Okay, so this is a this is a, a strange one. You have to, any of you who do a lot of coding are pretty used to these ands and ors and building these things uh, in, in conditional uh, uh, like if statement evaluations. It's really the same logic here, but let's see if we can build this one. So I want, I want two possibilities. I want to account for the probability that it rains today, but not tomorrow, or the probability that it rains tomorrow, but not today. Okay, so we have the probability of the event A, intersection B complement. Uh, and I'm gonna leave the space between these vacant for just a moment, okay? The other event that I'm gonna allow is the case where it does not rain today, but it does rain tomorrow, okay? And now the question is, do we add these two things together? Do we put a union between them or do we put an intersection between them? What do you guys think? A union. You put a union between them. What would happen if I put an intersection between them? It would be zero. Yes, it would be, if I, by construction, these are mutually exclusive events. So if I talk about their union, I'm gonna get the probability of the empty set, which is zero, okay? So we, we have to put a union between these two things. And, uh, and, and now these are two mutually exclusive events. And so how do I write down their probabilities? Let's see if I'm, I'm veering way off track from uh, what he recommends here. Uh, okay, so, oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, so he, he, he points out that this is the probability in question and that we can write it as a probability of, a probability of A intersection B complement. They're two mutually exclusive events. We're interested in their union. So we can always do this, okay? And one of these things we've computed before, A intersection B complement was 0.2. So that one we don't have to worry about. We still have to think about this one, right? And remember that we can always write down the probability of an event B as the probability of B with A and the probability of B with, what am I about to do here? Somebody tell me what goes here. Decomposition of B into its overlap with A and... Is it A complement? A complement, excellent. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so I can always do this. I can always invoke this thing. And, and the advantage of doing this now, okay, that's my puppy. I'm sorry about that. You know, I don't know why you need to be in here during my class time. Uh, all right, so... All right. So 
here, here is our, here's your other classmate. Uh, all right, he's, uh, he's dripping wet. I hope that's not pee. Um, I'm pretty sure it's his water. I heard him splashing around over there. Uh, go away until, until five more minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, he's a corgi. Uh, his, his name is Genghis because he, he bites uh, every chance he gets. Um, okay, so he, um, uh, all right, I, you know, if the, the arrangement is that other people are supposed to watch him during my class time, uh, but I'm not sure. Somebody, somebody has let him go. Uh, okay. Um, uh, all right, so what did I, what did I want to do here? Um, I wanted to decompose. <laughs> that might be, that might be something I can arrange. Can you watch him between the hours of two and two and five in the morning when he has to poop on the floor? Um, that, that would be great. Uh, all right, so, uh, okay, we had to decompose this, this event here. This, this and this are the same, right? And so I can, I can take these two things and I can uh, write this as P of A intersection BC. Uh, uh, I'm gonna solve for the one over here and get P of B minus P of oh, B shoot. intersection A. It's just water. He's been splashing in his water bowl. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so we've already computed this, we've already computed this, and we've already computed this, okay? And so now we just fill in, fill in things that we've already done. And uh, this comes out to be uh, 0.3. Let me show you what all of those separate terms were. Uh, this one I think was 0.2 that we computed above. This one was point, uh, point 0.5 that was given. And this one was 0.4 that we computed in one of the earlier exercises, parts A or B. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys are, are getting, getting used to working with these things. And uh, next time we will um, reconvene and we will do some uh, more work with Bayes' theorem. All right. Have a good weekend. The answer to D is 0.3. Uh, professor, I just submitted 0 0.3. And yeah, the key says it's 0 0.1. Hmm, it should be 0 0.3. Uh, OK, so everybody will. Uh, so Zichu can, uh, you know, what, what happened, I think in that one is that in his, in his book, he, uh, does a calculation and intermediate step to get B intersection, a complement, And that answer is 0.1. It's the 0.5 minus the 0.4. Uh, but the final answer is uh, 0.3. So uh, may, maybe uh, Zichu can just uh, make a correction, give everybody credit for that one. Yeah, uh, that's right. my bad. I'll, I'll fix that later. Okay, no sorry problem. About this. No problem. Okay, thank you, everyone. And sorry for my uh, connectivity uh, deficiencies. It's, it's not really the connectivity. It's my ability to use technology. I will get better. Uh, all right, thank you. See you on Tuesday. <laughs>